All right, let's, uh, let's uh, go to the word in prayer. Father God, thank you for this time that we get to share together. I pray that you speak to us out of your word. Speak into our circumstances, speak into our lives, speak into the things that we are walking through right now. And may your word come alive for us tonight and help us navigate our lives following after you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. All right, if you guys want to check my work or read along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 for about a minute and a half. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 35. Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 35. It starts with this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked the Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of God is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, Six billion dollars, many experts in history say. Six billion dollars. 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was unable to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. That's about six grand in today's money, six grand. A hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went to their master and told him everything that had happened. Then the master called a servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive a brother or sister from your heart. So this is the word of the Lord on the topic of forgiveness. And I want to start by asking a question. Have you ever gotten in trouble for living your truth. Living your truth. Has anybody ever lived their truth, spoken their truth unapologetically in life? I remember when I was in ninth grade, I got in trouble for speaking my truth unapologetically. I was in the back seat of my mom's car, and I was talking with my sister, and we were discussing eighth grade projects. Now, eighth grade projects, just a little context, were awesome projects that we did at the school that we went to. I was in ninth grade, she was in eighth grade. In an eighth grade project, you could do it on whatever you wanted. It was a semester-long project that had a written component, an artistic component, a presentation component, a historical component, but it was, you got to pick your topic. You could pick whatever topic you wanted to do your eighth grade project on, you got to choose for yourself your project. It wasn't like they were picking countries and you got Ukraine and you had to do one on Ukraine. It wasn't like they were picking states and you got a state, so you had to write about Wisconsin. It was whatever you wanted to do, that was your topic you could choose. So when I was in eighth grade, I picked Marvel Comics because Marvel Comics are awesome. And we, my sister was now in eighth grade and I was in ninth grade and we were discussing her project and she wanted to do a project on the Mackinac Bridge. And I told her, that's a dumb idea. I was like, the Mackinac Bridge is boring. I was like, that's a stupid project. And I think I used the word stupid and dumb, which immediately hurt her feelings. And so she was upset. And seeing her being upset, I doubled down. Because I wanted to tell her the truth. I'm like, you could pick anything, and you're going to pick a dumb bridge? That's a dumb thing to do your project on. My my mom intervened. She goes, you got to knock it off. Stop it. Don't tell her that her project's dumb. And I was like... I whispered, I remember this vividly. I was like, your project's dumb. (laughs) And at that point, my mom pulled over (laughs) and kicked me out of the car. 
and I walked to school that day. But I was sharing my truth unapologetically. And we live in a world that encourages us to share our truths unapologetically. And this is why I think forgiveness is a concept, is an exercise, is a discipline that is fading out of society because we're told to live and speak our truths unapologetically. And I have uh, research to back this up. Does anybody know about the, uh, the, uh, the firm McKinsey? They do um, stuff with uh, consulting. Has anybody heard of McKinsey before? They're notorious. They're like one of the world's biggest research firms. They do stuff with consulting. And they said that Gen Z and the modern man in general values two things. Number one, they, uh, they value individual expression and they, va and they avoid labels because of that. They value individual expression and they avoid labels because of that. And they also mobilize themselves. This is Gen Z and the modern man. They mobilize themselves for a variety of justice and social causes. Okay? So, in dialogue, there are two thoughts that kind of summarize the modern man. Number one, everyone can live their own truth. Number two, justice and fighting for truth is the most important cause. Everyone can live their truth, and justice and fighting for truth are the most important cause. And I think that the next generation and my generation has incredible potential. I think that the future for the church is bright, but I think we're facing dangerous headwinds because basically we're encouraged to speak our truth unapologetically and fight for it. Do you see how that can breed conflict in our world? I'll fight for my truth. You fight for your truth. We'll each get our own version of truth that's equal and opposite. And at the same time, it's the most important thing in the world to us. Do you see how conflicts form? If my individual rights and justice as I see it and my identity are the most important element of my personhood, I can live life obsessed with me and compassion and empathy and selflessness and care for others disappears. That's why, despite the thought that dialogue will win the day, we are actually in the world today becoming a society that's breaking down, polarizing, and relationships interpersonally are fracturing. And there's one antidote to this problem, the discipline of forgiveness. I need forgiveness, you need forgiveness, we all need forgiveness. And the story I told you, it was kind of funny, but it was really not. Because I was harsh, and I was mean, and I was a bully to somebody who really looked up to me, my impressionable younger sibling. Never mind that I could have been encouraging and loving, never mind that I could have, you know, Never mind that maybe the Mackinac Bridge would be an awesome thing to do a project on, and maybe she could have taken a tour with an engineer, and it would have been cool, and she would have gotten footage, and maybe it would have inspired a life of architectural achievement in my sister. Never mind all that. I was mean. And, uh, and I need to apologize for that. And I needed to ask for forgiveness for that. But in that moment, I wanted to live my truth and speak my truth. But we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to look at life through other people's eyes and say, what does it look like to be you? What does it look like to stand in your shoes? We need to ask for forgiveness when we lay down what justice looks like in my eyes and instead live in humble mercy and walk with grace. Because here's the truth that I want to speak to you guys today. I want to speak the absolute truth. And this is the absolute truth. We are all sinners who are forgiven by God when we come and confess our sins to him. We are all sinners in need of grace. We are all sinners in need of a loving savior to intervene into our lives. And that's the truth. The world says, live your truth. I wanna live that truth. I have a savior who has saved me. And in light of that, I'm gonna be humble. In light of that, I'm gonna be compassionate. In light of that, I don't wanna pay attention to the debts that other people owe me. I want to be grateful for what God has given me, and out of that gratitude, that allows me to cancel out other people's debts. Here's the truth. God is faithful to forgive. God is gracious, kind, and loving. And I don't want to live my truth. I want to live in that truth. So 
How do we forgive? What does that look like? I think in Matthew 18, we have a blueprint for what forgiveness actually looks like, both asking for it and giving it to other people. Are you ready for the blueprint? Four things. Number one, the first thing that the king did in this story is he named the trespass truthfully as wrong and punishable rather than merely excusing it. He brought the servant before him and he said, what you did was wrong. What he didn't do was be passive aggressive. What he didn't do was excuse the problem. What he didn't do was explain it away. What he also didn't do was escalate and say, I'm gonna get revenge on you. He named it clearly. This is what you did. This is where you went wrong. Number two, the king identified the perpetrator as a fellow man. He didn't think that he was different than the person standing before him. And he willed for this man's good. That's what he did in forgiveness. Okay, he was compassionate. He wasn't dehumanizing. He didn't say, how could you? I would never. He said, yes, this is something we can all do. He humbled himself rather than pretending to be more righteous than he was. Number three, he released the wrongdoer of liability by absorbing the debt on himself rather than seeking payment or revenge. This is the most painful part of forgiveness because it might never actually get right this side of heaven. Whatever you're forgiving, it might not ever be repaired this side of heaven, but you're releasing that debt. You're saying, I'm taking this on myself. When the king excuses the debt in the story, the language that's used there is actually a picture of someone who's slowly burning. It's where the language of long suffering comes from because I'm taking it on myself. You owe me this. And many theologians say this debt could have destabilized the king's country. It speaks to the costly nature of the debt. And yet he said, I take it on myself. And then in giving forgiveness, he opened the door for reconciliation. This is important for forgiveness because forgiveness is step one towards restoration. A lot of times people think, well, if I forgive, that means that I'm declaring that everything's right. No, if you forgive, that means that you're opening the door for reconciliation. So whether or not somebody responds in kind, you are willing what's good for them. You're caring for them. You're holding out the hand of friendship, the hand of brotherhood, this hand of sisterhood, this hand of parenthood again. And you're saying you can come back, okay? So forgiveness opens the door for reconciliation. Whether or not the person that you're forgiving chooses to walk through that door, that's up to them. But forgiveness says the debt you owe is canceled. We can be reconciled. And here's the truth. Because God for first forgave us, we can forgive other people. We can cultivate compassionate, grateful, humble hearts that breed forgiveness in us. And we can share that with the people around us. And when we do that, we can trust that in the end, God is just. And in the end, all things can be restored. And in the end, maybe in heaven, my sister will be a bridge builder. Because that hurt is undone. But the only path forward to this side of heaven is to be reconciled. And the only way to be reconciled is to hold open the door of forgiveness. So that's what we're going to discuss with the rest of our time together. Uh, we've got three questions coming up next. If you want to turn back to the page in front of you and discuss that with the people around you. And then we're going to have a panel up here in a little bit. All right. I want to tell a little bit about everybody here. Emma Rausch is a sophomore, junior, sophomore, junior in college. Um, she is... Awesome. She helps me with middle school. She is also Diana Cook's right hand woman um, at InterVarsity at North Central Michigan Community College. And I can think of nobody better to put on this panel. Um, Aiden Cleary, senior at Petoskey High School. <laughs> All around great guy, wise beyond his years, fan of the Fighting Irish. Next. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. You might, you might go to school there. What's number one? Michigan. Michigan, okay. I have the shirt. Well, then you're riding high today. Congratulations. <laughs> My Spartans didn't fare so well. All right. 
Jim and Rhonda Desmond, hosts of Romance the Dance. <laughs> uh, awesome residents of Boyne City, Michigan, and uh, just fantastic helpmates to uh, the, sheer, the sheer hearts in all things ministry, correct? We love them very much, and we're thankful that they're on this panel as well. So let's pray real quick, and then... Uh, We'll get off to, the, off to the races. All right, Father God, <laughs> we'll get this thing off the ground. Thank you for these uh, men and women on the panel. Um, thank you for their courageous and sacrificial and giving hearts for um, being willing to open up and dialogue about forgiveness, something that is just the heart of the gospel, your heart towards us, God. Um, I pray that you give them clarity, you give them words, and that this time together is something that we cherish. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. What a great group tonight. I am so glad you're here. This is such a great topic, and we have a great panel. Thank you for being up here. Thank you for helping me. Oh, did I, I gotta move my hand. Let me slap my hand for just a second. Um, you're helping us, uh, by being here, you're helping us live out the mission and the vision of Genesis, of equipping the body. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to point out one thing that Johnny said. He said a lot of great stuff. Uh, but he said, I need forgiveness, you need forgiveness, and we need to forgive. I don't want you to forget that. So I'm going to turn to the panel here, and I'm going to start with you, Emma. Okay, I'm going to start with you. Would you um, share just how your relationship with God and God's word has impacted your view of forgiveness? How has God himself, his word, just kind of had an impact on the way you look at forgiveness? Yeah, so uh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I grew up in like a really awesome church family, grew up serving, grew up serving with my parents, which was beautiful and it was great. But I think that the stewardship that my parents taught us about forgiveness helped with that a lot. And they walked us through a lot of trial and error of me messing with my five younger siblings and sitting me down and being like, tell them you forgive them. Ask for forgiveness. You messed up. You need to ask. And it was embarrassing, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I think in scripture specifically, I always refer back to, I think it's like Ephesians, I'm going to say it's 1, 7 through 8, but I'm probably wrong. And it talks about like how God, like we should, we're called to live like Jesus, obviously. So in my opinion, when it comes to this specifically, if Jesus literally died on a cross brutally for us to forgive our sins, I should also mm. be probably trying to do that for the most part. And I think that that's the biggest thing for me. Oh, and that's wonderful. And thank you for that. You know, as we're raising up our families to be thinking, how do we, how do we work this into our family dynamics? Would anyone else like a shot at that? Who would like to answer that one? Would you like to talk about it, Aiden? Like how your relationship with God or, or God's word, how has it impacted the way you look at forgiveness? Any thoughts? Well, um, it's been very... Very humbling because I tend to like when I do something wrong, I don't always see why I was wrong all, uh, right away. So like I have to, I have to think about it and I have to um, come to the conclusion. And then once I do that, it's it's especially hard to like even after maybe I like defending myself, I'm like, well, uh, I'm not, I'm not wrong to um, the person I wronged. Then it's even harder to like take that next step. But um, I always try to remember that, like, if God can always forgive me for what I'm doing, oh, wait, we were talking about forgiving other people. Anyway, <laughs> no, no, it works. wrong in me. Forgiveness in general. <laughs> yeah, but, um, like, if God, if God can forgive me for whatever I'm doing, I know this is a pretty broad theme, but um, then I can forgive anyone for anything. So, like, yeah. Thank you for that. That's all I and got. that that kind of reflects back on the, the parable that Johnny read about what's called the unmerciful servant. You know, he's forgiven, and then he goes out and doesn't forgive. And so th thank you for pointing that out. What about you, Jim or Rhonda? What, um, how has your relationship with God and God's word impacted your view of forgiveness? Oh, it's impacted me a lot. Um, yeah, I grew up, I had a real driver as a father, for an example, a real successful man and uh, kind of sampled for me that it doesn't matter who you run over, just get to where you need to get to. 
And in that, uh, as I grew up, um, I hurt a lot of people in relationships, in um, you know, boyfriend-girlfriend relationships, in friend relationships, uh, and didn't really realize the pain that I caused until I came to know God, actually. And I looked back at my life, and I realized kind of a wake that I had created behind me. And so um, I went on a journey after coming to know Christ to try to go back, and years later, to people that didn't even, probably had forgotten about me. But I needed to go back and ask for forgiveness because I hadn't realized, until it, until it happened to me, didn't really realize the pain that I could cause someone. Because it was so surface in my mind. And uh, so that was an interesting journey. And I realized that not everybody accepted that mm -hmm. from me. Some people did. Uh, but what was important is that I was getting right in God's eyes mm -hmm. and doing what I was required to do through God's eyes that I need to ask for forgiveness and forgive. And you can't control how people would react to that, mm -hmm. but you just hope. Thank you for sharing. And you became a, a Christian as an adult, right? So I did. I was born... Yeah. Um, Catholic. I got baptized as a, you know, probably 10 days old. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I got baptized again in my late 30s. Sure. sure. So, um, so it was when you became a, a Christian, you know, just walk with me for a second. You know, it's like special glasses got put on your eyes yeah. and you saw a whole different world. And I, th I think I just want to say this. If you're not a Christian, you know, that's one of the great things about following Christ is you will see the world different. The second thing to think about that I think you've presented here is we have to have some patience for people that are not Christians. They don't see the world the way we do. Rhonda, would you like to add anything onto this? Uh, has your relationship with God showed you anything about forgiveness uh, or thing that you'd like to share? Yeah, I, th I think um, understanding biblical forgiveness has been huge for me um, and being forgiven and forgiving others um, I'm a, I find that I'm more quickly to forgive but um, when I am in those places where I'm struggling to forgive somebody um, it's a good reminder to for me to meditate on what Jesus did on the cross because that was to forgive us for our sins. That was a, if, if forgiving sins was easy, his death wouldn't have had to be so hard and so long and so painful and so horrific. So sometimes I have to remember that um, forgiveness is a process. And so sometimes it takes um, feeling grief and um, pain and intense emotions and all those things that come with hard things to forgive until we're at the point where we, we bleed out and we're left with nothing like him and we just say it is finished and we have forgiven. And so I have to remember that forgiveness um, biblically doesn't mean it's just going to appear like otherwise Jesus would have just yeah. been beheaded. He would have twinkled like, his nose. Like, do, 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 okay, do, do, you're do. done, and now you believe yeah. in Jesus, and forgiveness should come easy to you. Yeah. It doesn't. And so yeah. I remind myself of that long journey of forgiveness, mm -hmm. and sometimes my forgiveness journey takes like three years. But, um, but it's in process, and it's that willingness to go through the process to get to reconciliation mm -hmm. that we see God is working and he's changed us. So. Thank you for that wonderful point. I just want to point out Ephesians 4.32, just very brief. It says, forgive as Christ forgave you. It's a very short verse. 
that you can tuck away in your brain and and it will help you. This next question, I'm only going to have two people share because um, we need to move on. There's some other goodies and time is going away from us. Um, how has the act, so whoever wants to do this has to, it's kind of like that game where they have to hit the thing faster than the other people. Um, how has the act of being forgiven or forgiving someone else set you free relationally? Who would like to share about that? The act of, go ahead, Emma. I'll start us out. You want <laughs> it. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. Um, so just like a quick brief testimony to like share yeah. amongst the topic. Um, when I was like three or four years old, um, we were getting ready to move to West Texas for my family. And we lived with our grandparents up north here who did foster care. Beautiful thing. It was amazing. But as many of us know, foster care systems, they're kind of broken. And we dealt with a lot of really hurt kids. And some of these kids come from homes where they're like raised in a pattern that's like not normal. So when I was about three or four years old, um, one of our foster kids actually assaulted me um, and we moved. The situation was dealt with when it happened, but we moved west and we came back in 20, I wanna say 2014, mm -hmm. um, and they had adopted him. So I had to live in the same house as this person for about two years. And it was quite the experience <laughs> to come back and my parents were kind of like, we know you don't really remember that because you were a kid, but like, do you really feel comfortable being in that space with somebody? Because you're gonna be living in the same household. And mm. so that yeah. was a big step for me where it was like relationally, like I needed oh. to forgive this person and I needed to slowly reconcile with the situation as well. Because mm -hmm. like Johnny hit on, reconciliation is a process. It's definitely yeah. tough. Um, yeah. And I think for me, especially in that specific time, I had forgiven him and I had moved on from that. But the trust and like opening up the door to like share a space with someone that something like that has happened in is a totally different situation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Emma. Um, <clears throat> you know, forgiveness opens the door to the next level, which is reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation opens the door to the next step, which is restoration. Right. Those are all long, slow processes. And so forgiveness with boundaries is important. You're like, you're letting go of it, but there's still boundaries. I think that's important to say. Um, who wants to, also wants to add on here? I was just going to say about, um, I saw an amazing um, example of forgiveness when my mom, uh, with my mom and her father, and he, when we were growing up, it was always like, we're not going to your grandparents' house because he was an incredibly abusive person to my mom. Mm -hmm. But when he was dying, my mom was by his side. And it was like, I had never even really knew him, but because it was, we're not going there, we're not doing this, and then she was there with him. And so I had to reconcile that relationship of my mom and her father, but it was just like, to see her be there with the man that was just terrible to her was very powerful. It's like, it's like you, you can only know Jesus and, and sit there next to something like that, to what we were pretty much told is a, a monster of a human. So that was powerful. Thank you so much for that. I encourage each of you, if you have a situation, to run towards forgiveness. It, it'll change your life. It will set you free, as the question says. Let's move on here to, um, I want to ask this question, and I'll, I'll ask Aiden first here, since he's been saving up his words. How, what are the alternatives to forgiveness that you've seen people take? What are the alternative ways somebody hurts them? What have you seen people do? Um, one popular way, I think, especially among like guys, like maybe me and my brother and me and my friends, is um, to just like, it's whatever. Like, you forget about it, it happens, and the next time you see each other, it's like, it never happened, which I think, in one way, and that, like, it can be let go, is good, but I think what's missing is, like, the whole forgiveness in the conversation, which um, could definitely, you know, be more restorative and create a healthier relationship. Yeah, and 
really address with candor the things that happened, you know, and go deeper than maybe in the relationship. Thank you for that. What about you, Jim? Uh, any thoughts on this one? What, what other ways have you seen dealt with uh, instead of using forgiveness? You know, alternatives is the question. I think um, a lot is escapism mm. from forgiveness. Um, okay. You know, just not knowing how to deal with it, and that could be workaholism, it could be alcoholism, it could be, you know, I, I've seen uh, friends of mine who would stay working with me, and they would stay, if I let them, till 10 o'clock at night because they didn't want to go home, because they didn't know how to deal with whatever was happening at home. Mm. And in their mind, they were providing for their family, and this is good, but their family needed them. They, they needed that um, nurturing. They're avoiding. Avoidance, right. So, and, and again, that can raise its head in a million different ways. Alcoholism, drug addiction, um, sexaholism, all kinds of things. So. Um, mm -hmm. I think that shows itself a lot in society today. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, I, I think one thing that I've seen is like immediate judgment without listening. Immediate judgment. And you know, that leads to some of the cancel culture stuff that we see, but just you, they did this, you judge them and there's no empathy or trying to, you know, see it from them. That, that's an alternative we see that, that we could do. Let's move on here. Um, we got a couple more really good questions. I don't want to miss out on any of these. What's easier? Anybody can answer this. What's easier? Forgiving others or asking for forgiveness and forgiving yourself? Which is easier for you? Let's start with Rhonda. What is easier for you? Forgiving others. I mean, let's just say it this way. Forgiving Jim or, <laughs> or, or forgiving issue. yourself. <laughs> Or asking for uh, I, Probably um, forgiving others is easier because asking forgiveness is like admitting you did something wrong. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to be like, yeah, I forgive you. Because, but it is because you can draw on God's strength. And the, the word here tells us how to do it. And we have, you know, I have... Um, my small micro group, which I go to, and they hold me accountable for forgiveness and, and to not let that um, unforgiveness seep mm. back in. Mm. So I think it's, yeah, easier to extend forgiveness than ask for it. How about you, Emma? What do you think? What's easier to... You always go to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, might as well. <laughs> um, I think, for me, forgiving myself is the easiest. I think not having to publicly deal with anything is like... Publicly dealing with things is like my biggest fear, personally. So <laughs> having to forgive myself is much easier for me because it's interrelational and it's just me and God dealing with something and it's not me having to go to somebody and be like, hey, you really hurt my feelings. I'm going to need a sorry for that. And it's not me having to be like, oh... I, f I guess I can. I guess I can forgive you for that. So I think forgiving myself is the easiest. Well, let's wrap this up with some tips. We're gonna let everybody share this one. What are some tips you have for forgiving people who might not ever change? They might never change. They might continue in the same way. What are some tips our panel would give to everybody and? I'm sure if we have everybody raise their hand, they have people in their life that doesn't seem like they're going to change. Do I forgive them? What would be your tips? Jim, why don't you start, my friend? Oh, my goodness. That's, that's a hard one because um, just remember that you cannot change people. You can't. And you have to let expectations go. I mean, look at Christ. He was the king of everything, the creator of all, right? Wouldn't his expectation be to come down and rule over everybody? But he said he served us all. And that was his example. So mm -hmm. you, you, you have no control over how somebody's going to react. And think of what he did at, on the cross. He said, these are the people that literally killed him. He said, forgive them, Father. Why? for they know not what they do. Mm, mm, mm. And not everybody that you forgive understands what they did. 
And you can't make them understand. You just have to ask okay. for forgiveness in your own heart and for God to forgive them. Yeah. How about, thank you for that, Jim. Aiden, what about you? What are your thoughts? Any, any, any tips for us on, you know, someone that needs forgiveness, but you don't think they're going to change? What do you think? Um, I don't have, I don't know that I have any experience with that, but um, I would say just always living an example, always, um, always doing what you think God wants you to do, and constant praying for for them and for yourself to have strength, because that, that can be hard. You know, that can seem impossible sometimes, but, um, yeah. but yeah, you just got to ask God for strength and um, yeah. pray that one day maybe they can change. Thank you for that. Practice it. Just, and Johnny was telling me you and him had a conversation about confession, about confessing your sins and having confession, you know, in your uh, faith, you know, tradition. And that is practice on how to f work forgiveness. Can you, anything to add to that that I just right. said? Or? So, yeah, I'm Catholic. I've been um, raised Catholic, you know, baptized just like in my whole life. But um, I don't know that I really ever really came to know God until a couple years ago when I started coming to youth group here. And, um, but confession, that always stuck out to me. We would go there during school because I went to St. Francis too. And... Um, that was a really good way, you know, because um, if you, like, forgive or are forgiven by someone else, then that's between you and them. But I feel like since you can't, like, physically talk to God and you can't, um, like, I guess, see or hear yourself being forgiven all the time, um, confessing to, like, a person, the priest, that was a really good way to um, let things go. And it was a really... Um, a good practice. Know, yeah. Thank you for that, Aiden. Rhonda, would you like to wrap it up here? Uh, any any tip for us to? I would say um, you get the last word. The last word. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Satan is going to use unforgiveness as a weapon against us because extending biblical forgiveness to people can be part of our greatest testimony to people mm. because people don't mm. understand it. And so I would mm. say don't get stuck there because you're letting the devil win at that point. So just continue. You're living before an audience of one, and you have to have a clear conscience before God. And like Jim said, you can't, you can't control how the other person's going to react. So don't let the devil get a foothold with unforgiveness. Let's give our panel a big hand. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, panel. This is probably like one of the heavier topics that we've handled at Equip. And so just another hand for them as they take their seats. Thank you, guys. And it is. I think at the end of our time together, I want to get to the third question in table time, too, because I do know we've got families in this room. We've got people in this room who have walked out forgiveness before and need to walk it out again uh, with people that are difficult and challenging and might not ever change, but that does not mean that I will ever stop wishing for their good, wishing for their best. I'm not gonna take revenge, I'm not gonna take it in my own hands. So let's go to table time. Make sure that you get to question number three so we have an opportunity to pray together for restoration. All right, I wanna open it up to everybody, I know some people are still talking, but I want to do just question number one, share practically things that help, have helped you forgive or ask for forgiveness. If anybody knows anybody else at their table who had a really good answer to this question, put them on the spot right now. Lean over and say, say what you said to the whole group. Okay, come on. Come on, Miss Forrester. I got it. We had two people say that um, praying was the only way they could get through it. They couldn't really talk to anybody about it, but when they were in prayer, um, it might have taken a long time. One person confessed that it took them a long time, but praying and talking to God was the only way they finally got there. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else? Tips? 
practically. Brenda. I think um, remembering that the person is a human created by God. Um, and especially in our marriage. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, putting it out there, this helps in other areas too, but um, just understanding that, you know, giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, a lot of times hurt, the hurt we have, it's not intentional, and we forget that. We, f we think they're out to get us, and they, they did this on purpose, and they did this, and it, it could be something totally unrelated of what's going on in their own life, so viewing them as a human being created by God and giving them the benefit of the doubt helps grow empathy in you to be able to forgive. Yeah. yeah. And it's not, yeah, I literally today, we pulled into a parking lot, my wife and I, and there was a car parked in the wrong spot. And I was like, what's going on here? And I like did like a donut around them to park. And she goes, what if they've broken down? And I was like, oh, that, that's another perspective. <laughs> but my first perspective was they're wrong. They're wrong for being where they are. And it is, it is a discipline to say, what if there's more to this story than just what I'm getting? Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead. You know, some of you heard my story. I, my, I had a really rough relationship with my father growing up. He was a very abusive and selfish man. And I, I will never forget the day when I went and looked him in the eye and I asked, you know, I told him that I forgave him. He didn't get it. He was indifferent about it. Um, but I had a different perspective on life after that, kind of like what we were talking about with Jim. And, you know, it was just, uh, I, I don't want to ever forget that. And so I practice it. It's just like, it, it's hard to do. It's, it's like any discipline, but it's the thing that brings the most happiness. I just feel freed. And so that's, that's my hint for you is to just practice it, even though it's hard you will feel better. It will help you heal. You will be able to move on, and God will be praised. I think of it like writing a check on behalf of somebody else. It's like, you're not going to be able to pay me back for this. I'm going to write the check, and you'll never write a check that God, in his mercy and love and grace for you, can't cash because it's deposited or it's withdrawn from his account, and his account has... It's that unlimited account that you get to tap into in those moments that it's hardest. Something that's helped me is remembering that God is a God of justice. And I think in forgiveness, it's my job to extend forgiveness, trusting that God is just and God is good and God sees people's pain. I remember one time there was somebody that I was harboring unforgiveness in my heart towards somebody for years. And then in like a moment, I realized that they were harboring unforgiveness for themselves in their heart for years. And I was like, you have heartache and pain beyond anything that I could ever hope to pour out on you in vengeance from the consequences of your actions. And it's my job to love. It's my job to forgive. It's my job to say, show mercy and say, you know, shame off of you now. I have Christ. I'm healed. It's okay and bring healing to them. And I remember saying that, saying like, you are forgiven, it's okay, you are forgiven, it's okay for the first time ever. And realizing that I needed to say that in order for them to stop having a heart that was just burning with guilt. Anybody else? Heather, <laughs> wait your turn. <laughs> wow, I beat out Diane to speak for once. <laughs> So um, it was said in different ways, but our whole group were kind of talking a little bit about um, instead of focusing on what we're against and the person, like the, the behavior, which oftentimes we're self-righteous about that, but um, focusing more on the end game, you know, what, the, what we're for, which is for relationships, for um, redemption, for reconciliation, for peacemaking. Um, so. Can I tell you how Dorothy Prince always told me? She goes... My mom would go, what's more important, the relationship or being right? Being right. No, it's not. It's the relationship every time. All right, go ahead. All right. A, a strategy I would say is um, if you're a people person, talking things through. But I have a, a testimony to give here that it was one of Norm's sermons. 
And um, sometimes you don't realise you have not forgiven somebody until someone like Norm comes along. And it's not just Norm, it's other people too. Speak a truth into your life and God just cracks something open in you. And Norm was just preaching the good old word. He wasn't being fancy, you know, Norm. He just talks it like it is. And this hit me over the head. And the person I needed to forgive, and I didn't even realize that, was my daughter. After she had um, died, I didn't realize I was harboring stuff against her. So I had to forgive her. And um, so I would say that, that hearing the word and being Preach the word is going to help you. And I question, even tonight, maybe some of you are sitting there going, I don't have anybody to forgive. I didn't think I had anybody to forgive. But boy, did God convict me that day. And wow, who was it? Oh, Norm actually said that when he forgave his father, the relief he felt, I didn't realize I was carrying that burden until I was able to say, I, I forgive you, Des. I, I forgive you. And um, yeah. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray one last time. In the spirit of uh, what was just shared, God, I am in a room with people like me. People who have hurt other people and people who have been hurt by other people. People who need forgiveness, who need declared over their lives, you are forgiven. You are released. The debt is no more. It's been paid. We need to know that in our hearts, God. It's not our works. It's not our righteousness. It's not our goodness that frees us from our debts, from our guilt. It's the declaration of forgiveness. And when we, when we receive that into our hearts and souls, we are able to share that with the people around us. And we were able to mend which is that which is broken, restore that which is destroyed. And I pray for marriages, and I pray for families, and I pray for siblings, and I pray for um, mothers and fathers and sons and daughters in this room and outside of this room who need restoration, God. That your mercy would pervade our lives and change us. Your forgiveness would soak into our souls and allow us to act in the same way towards others. I pray this in your name, Jesus, as we leave this place. Amen.